talk about next is looking at the poetic parts of the Bible. So when you think of Psalms and parts of the prophets and things like that, and the poetry in Scripture. We've been looking at this method of Bible study where you first observe as much as you can within Scripture. And logically, of course, right? You're going to read it, reread it, read it again, and you're going to uh, look for as much detail as you can. And when you're in the process of training your eyes to see as much detail in Scripture, it helps to know what kind of details to look for. So we talked about questions to ask of who is in the text, what happens in the text, when does it happen, are there any chronological clues, ages, things like that that are mentioned, um, where does it happen, and then eventually we move on to the, su the subject of interpretation. So what did that biblical author have in mind when he wrote his original audience, Paul to Ephesus, Moses to the children of Israel, that sort of thing. And that's when you ask why. Why is this in the text? And once you've observed as carefully as you can and interpreted as carefully as you can, then you're prepared to make accurate application to yourself. What now do I do with this text? Um, and so we've moved to this application stage of things, and we started to talk about the narrative portions of the Bible, which is to say the stories, the history. So when you think of any book of the Bible, that's just recounting things that happened. Those are books of narrative or story, and again, story doesn't necessarily mean fiction. And of course, in the terms of scripture, unless we're talking about parables, it certainly doesn't mean fiction. Then we um, talked about studying the parts of the Bible that we would consider of the law. Those are our difficult texts to work through, even more difficult sometimes to apply. On the other hand, biblical poetry is oftentimes people's favorite scriptures. Uh, to read. And that's what I'd like for us to talk about this evening. We're going to, in the coming weeks, we have just a few more lessons left. We're going to talk about uh, studying the books of the Bible that are the prophets. Uh, we're going to talk about wisdom literature, so you think of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, that sort of thing. We're going to talk about the epistles, which is another one of my favorite portions of this. Um, I didn't know for most of my life, that when Paul wrote Romans, for example, or 1 Corinthians, or any of those sizable epistles, it cost as much to produce those letters as I paid for my first car. I had no idea it was so expensive to make those letters. Just to talk about how to, to read the epistles of Scripture, and then we'll top everything off with apocalyptic literature. and looking at the book of Revelation and what to do with that particular book. I remember growing up in Georgia, and I don't remember who it was, the preacher that came to, to speak for us, I'm sure he did an absolutely fine job, but I'd grown up in the South, and as far as I knew, it was Revelations. Nobody called it Revelation, it was Revelations, and it drove me nuts listening to him say Revelation that whole week. I didn't know why he had to do that and be all you know, picky about it and had to have it right. Well, the fact of the matter is, young me was wrong, as old me often is, and he was right. It is the revelation of John. And then along with revelations, we would always talk about Psalms this and Psalms that. So Psalms chapter 2 and Psalms chapter 23 and Psalms 54. And he didn't do that either. He said Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3. And I didn't understand why. Well, some of you probably already know this. When you're looking at the Psalms, the collection of those Psalms, you're looking at that exactly that. A collection of Psalms, not chapters in a book. So if you ever hear somebody make an annoying point of saying Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3, that's why they're doing so, because it's the third Psalm, or the 23rd Psalm, or what have you. So, when we're looking at scriptures, we've said the Bible more or less boils down to stories and poems. Not all of it, but a large portion of it. We've talked about the narratives of scripture already, the Gospels, the Old Testament histories, those are certainly in story form. Even when we talked about the law, the law is given as a part of the story of Israel. But now we want to look at the poetry of the Bible. And when we get to the prophets, as I said, those are often works of poetry set within the story of the Old Testament. So no matter what, you never stray too far from these two types of literature. And I think perhaps the best way to start this evening is by contrasting poetry with what it is that we're familiar with. That is, stories or prose or narrative. And to illustrate the difference between the two, I'd ask you to turn to Judges 4 and 5. I'm going to try to have as much of this on the screen as I can, but Judges 4 and 5. What we're going to do is compare 
an account that's written like a story, like prose in chapter 4, and then we'll look at a retelling of that very same story, only in poetry in chapter 5. And I want us to consider some of the differences between the two accounts as a way of highlighting the characteristics and strengths of biblical poetry. So for context, in Judges 4, Israel is being oppressed by a Canaanite people whose army is commanded by a man named Sisera. The judge and prophetess Deborah has called Barak to lead Israel's forces into battle against Sisera. And when they are successful, Sisera flees to the tent of Heber the Kenite, whose family are descendants of Moses' father-in-law, and yet they have made a pact with Sisera's king. So these descendants of, of Moses' family have made a pact with this Canaanite king. The only thing is, Heber's wife, Jael, does not intend to honor any such pact when it comes to an oppressor of God's people. Jael's part of the story begins in verse 17. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. What do you think of that story? <laughs> so he died, just in case you were wondering, well, what happened to him? So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went in to her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. That's quite the content. That's the account in prose formatting. So recount it like you would read it in a history book, the story being told. But then in Judges 5, what you have is a poetic retelling of what we just read. This is a song about it that Deborah and Barak apparently wrote to celebrate this victory over their enemy. We're going to skip most of it, unfortunately, and we're going to read only the part that retells what we just read in chapter 4. And that's verses 24 through 27. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She, set her hand, she sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell. Dead. So that is the poetic version to the previous chapter's uh, historical account. You just consider the differences stylistically. For example, the poetic version is a bit more graphic. It's pretty graphic no matter what if you're driving a tent peg into somebody's head. But she crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. It's far more graphic. And the descriptors are much more intense. There's also a fair bit of repetition, uh, particularly there at the end. You didn't have that in the, the narrative account in chapter 4. There's fewer words even with all of that repetition. And yet, there is more detail. There's more repetition across fewer words and yet more detail, more emotion that is conveyed. And that is one of the great strengths of poetry. Everyone's heard the phrase before that a picture is worth a thousand words. Picturesque language that poetry typically employs allows it to do a lot more with a lot less. So when we were talking about the stories of the Bible, we talked about why God would use stories to convey so much information. Why when Jesus would come, would he do most of his teaching in the form of parables, stories? And let's apply that same question to what we're talking about now. 
Why would God, why do you think God chose to convey so much of the truth of his word in the form of poetry? You can think logically about it. Certainly it aids in memorization. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I am terrible at remembering things. But if you set it to a rhythm in a song, I can remember anything. To this day, I can tell you every single inflection of, of music and lyric that is coming in that song, One Sweet Day by Boyz II Men and Mariah Carey, it's not going anywhere. When most people are, are hearing the words and it's set to some kind of a, a poetic form, for ancient Israel, well, most people are hearing the words. They don't have their own personal copy of the law. And they're going to have to remember it by hearing it. And for somebody in that position, well, poetry is especially important. Along with that, because poetry uses the kind of word pictures that it does, the, the, the strong imagery that it does, it elicits emotion in us, which helps it to be a very effective means of conveying a point. That doesn't mean stories can't do the same thing. If you think of the story of the prodigal son, that elicits a lot of emotion in people too. But when you look at the historical account of, of a battle versus the poetic account, there's just a much more fervent, passionate picture of what takes place found in the latter. Poetry helps us stir our emotions. Um, think about all the different songs of allegiance that we have. The different national anthems, the different alma mater songs that are designed to build this sense of, of loyalty and fervor. Or honestly, think of the many love songs and all the ballads that are out there. It's the same idea that's at work in them. So poetry very effectively conveys both the intellectual thought, whatever the concept is, but also the emotional response that befits that concept. And the fact that God chose poetry and stories tells us something about our nature, uh, or about, excuse me, about his own nature. And that is that he has great passion and feels things as well. God is love, as we said this morning. Another thing that poetry does is it stimulates our imagination because of those word pictures that it uses. It's not just simply an assimilation of information. It causes us to think even more and to imagine, what would that have looked like? What would that have become like? So sometimes people don't think they're big fans of poetry. But if you think about how important and powerful music is in our culture, and most songs are just poems set to music. And listening to music is a very different thing for us than, than reading a book or the paper. You might enjoy both, but you can still appreciate the, the differences of what music brings to the table. And the very things that we've just highlighted about poetry are many of the same reasons why music has such an impact on us. And moving on, um, flashbacks to that one English class we had in Bible study. We were talking about all those grammatical kind of aspects of the text to know what to look for. Some of the characteristics of, of poetry in the Bible are a little bit different from our way of doing poetry. Some of them are similar. Um, a lot of times when we think of poetry, we think of rhyming. So constructing our poetry with parallel word sounds. We might also think of meter or rhythm. So Jack and Jill went up the hill. That both rhymes with the concluding parallel word sounds and then also da 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 kind of has that, that rhythm to it. That isn't what Hebrew poetry was like. Um, there's a bit of a debate on this, but those that I regard on the topic have a hard time seeing it. Um, it wasn't really built on the, the concept of parallel word sounds like rhyming or parallel rhythm like the meter of a song. There may have been some of that latter, but it doesn't really seem to be. So then what would make it poetry? Well, brevity is one thing. Hebrew poetry usually uses fewer but more descriptive words than stories. Uh, if you have a Bible that formats your section of poetry in the way that poetry is typically formatted, then you can see this, right? You can see the brevity in the form of all the white space on each of those pages. If you fan through your Old Testament, it's very obvious, isn't it? Whenever you reach a section of poetry, because all of a sudden there's tons of, of white space on the page. Because of the way that poetry is written like this in these, these brief kinds of lines, it is also easy to read it wrong. 
when you see a dramatic break in the text like that, where it skips down to an entirely different line, well, it's quite naturally to, to kind of put a pause there, isn't it? And to read haltingly where you're honoring each break in the line, but we're actually not supposed to do that. Um, as you read poetry, what you want to use is the punctuation as a guide, the same way that you normally would. And I know this sounds uh, silly, but ignore the line breaks. And I'll illustrate to you what we mean by this. Um, different Bibles will punctuate and format things differently. But for example, this is verse 27 uh, here on the screen. Line 1 is between her feet. Line 2 is he sank, he fell, he lay still, and then so on. Um, in my Bible, the end of line 1, which is between her feet, has no punctuation. I imagine that's true for most of you if you're looking at it in front of you. No comma, no period. Uh, some of you may have something, but I, I don't think, I, I think most of you may be needing it. So if you're reading a line of poetry and you come to the end, if it doesn't have a comma or a period or a semicolon or something like that, keep reading, even if it goes on to the next line. On the other hand, when you see a comma, even if it's in the middle of the line, pause. When you see a period or a semicolon, a little bit more. It'll help you get the, the proper idea. Um, so if, if you read this bit of poetry line by line with no attention paid to the punctuation, then the result is between her feet, he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet, he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. But if you read it for the punctuation and you ignore the breaks, between her feet, he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell. Dead. Now, I'm no performer, but you can hear the difference, I imagine. Hebrew poetry is comprised of those brief lines that are written to work with each other, and, and our reading of them needs to be guided by the punctuation, which is counterintuitive to our minds when we see those, those breaks in the line. You want to break with it, but don't. Um, a second major element of this kind of poetry, as we mentioned, is, is picturesque language, very vivid imagery. To bring that about, poetry uses a few different things. So personification is one tactic that you'll encounter. Personification is when you attribute the characteristics of a person to something that isn't one. So Psalm 148 is, when we, or is where we get our song, Hallelujah, <coughs> Praise Jehovah. In verse 3, um, you may notice what is called upon to, to praise the Lord. It's the sun and the moon and the stars. Well, they're not personal beings. Angels, people can, can praise God, but, but even the sun, moon, and stars are called upon to praise Him. You see as it continues uh, in verse 9, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. And it finishes in verse 13, let them praise him. The point of that kind of imagery, to have even trees and rocks and hills and stars praising God, is that God deserves praise so much, even those things that can't praise him should praise him. So personification, you're attributing the nature of a person, like the ability to praise or clap or sing, to something that is not a person. Now similar to personification, but more thorough, is anthropomorphism. When something is anthropomorphized, the writer has assigned the attributes of a, him, of a human, so parts of the body or actions or qualities that are distinctively human to a thing. More often, honestly, to God in Scripture. Um, so if you've ever seen just about any cartoon ever, you've encountered this. Those are my top three, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, not this new age stuff. Phineas and Ferb, Timeless, and Bluey. And if you haven't seen Bluey, you need to watch it. <laughs> Turtles, a platypus, and dogs given human bodies and qualities. In Scripture, you'll see this most often when the writers attribute human characteristics to God. They'll talk about the arm of the Lord, the right hand of God, the eyes of the Lord, that kind of thing. That the eyes of the Lord are open, His ears are attentive to their crime. 
God is, is so far above us, if he didn't find some way of approaching us on our level and explaining things on our level, we'd never understand anything. And this is one way that he does it. So personification is animating an inanimate object. The rocks cry out. The heavens sing your praise. Anthropomorphism, on the, hand, on the other hand, is giving that rock a mouth or giving God eyes and limbs. So it's, it's more blunt, more, uh, uh, more um, emphatic. You've also got uh, similes and metaphors, and both are ways of comparing one thing to the other, but once again, a simile is, is a comparison that can be made, and a metaphor is more dramatic. So similes are comparisons that employ the use of words such as like or as or such as. Psalm 42, verse 1 is a good example of this. It comes from something else that we sing. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. So in the same way that a deer longs for those streams of fresh, cool water to quench its thirst, my soul longs for the God of heaven, who's as essential to me as a stream is to a deer. Then you have metaphors. Metaphors are more direct. They don't use like or as, and that allows them to pack a bit more punch. So if you'll appreciate the difference between the Lord is like a shepherd versus the Lord is my shepherd. Or God is like love. Doesn't that's true, but it doesn't hit home the same way as God is love. That's a comparison using a metaphor. Now, another important facet of poetry is hyperbole, which is to say exaggeration for effect. In Psalm 50 and verse 10, it's kind of a classic example of this. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. If you read that like narrative, like history being recounted with information laid out before you, and you take it literally, this is important because it affects a lot of other things, as a matter of fact, when you're studying scripture, but if you take this literally, every bit of it, then do you notice what you're forced to conclude? As far as the animals in the forest goes, God owns every one of them. But when it comes to the cattle, he owns cattle on a thousand hills. But the cattle on all the rest of the hills belong to someone else. And obviously that's not the point. The psalmist's intended point is the very opposite. All the creatures of the earth belong to God. Ignoring hyperbole in poetry is a common mistake that folks make, especially when they read the prophetic parts of the Bible that are written in poetic format. It's very easy to take vivid imageries and try to press them into literal things when context would show you that's not God's intention. The same pitfall is present even in the stories of the Bible too, though. Um, in Luke 10, for example, when Jesus sends out the 72 and they're very successful in preaching the gospel and healing the sick and casting out demons. And they return. They're tremendously excited and they're praising God. You get this wonderfully authoritative, almost fatherly moment as, as Jesus offers his approval of their good work. They're exclaiming how things went. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Did he mean that literally? For some reason, Satan rebelled against God a long time ago, whenever that happened, but God didn't actually kick him out of heaven until the 72 went out and taught the gospel. Or it wasn't until just now that God was finally able to purge heaven of him, and out he went. That doesn't make any sense at all. It's hyperbole. You did so much good proclaiming the good news and reversing the effects of the curse. It was like I could see Satan falling from power like lightning falling from heaven. It's a beautiful passage. And I will tell you this same issue can play a part doctrinally. The root of Calvinism is the belief that we're all born depraved. We bear the guilt of Adam's sin from before we take our first breath. One of the classic passages for this comes from David's prayer, a prayer of penitence regarding his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, 
he says in verse 5, In sin did my mother conceive me. She was in sin. I was conceived in sin. I carry that with me still. Some of you probably encountered this. I was conceived in sin. Some take that language and try to extrapolate from it this big theological point that we're born sinners. The problem is, and I, I kind of love this, this is David too. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. From the womb I've been trusting in you. Which is to say I've always trusted in you. Can you see that Psalm 51 is doing the exact same thing just in the case of Psalm 51? What's David's point? I've always fallen short. Just like in Psalm 22, I've always trusted God. His point isn't that he was singing songs of praise in utero. His point was, you've always been my God. But then aren't there those days? Those days if you're always falling short? That's all. You can't take either passage and try to press it literally into some theological point, because you're going to have a problem if you do. Those are our two examples of hyperbole. I've always been a sinner. I've always trusted in God. You're making statements based in reality, but you're exaggerating it for the effect. So to emphasize on the one hand how sinful you've come to understand you are, or on the other hand how deeply you've always cherished the fact that God has been there for you. Examples of hyperbole. And that brings us to the one we're going to spend the most time with. And it's one final element of Hebrew poetry, but it is far and away the most important one. It's often referred to as parallelism. If you've never heard of this before, if you haven't, then once you go to look for this, you will never read biblical poetry the same again. I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. Um, as I mentioned, in our way, actually I'm curious, how many of you have heard of this before, Hebrew parallelism? Okay, some of you may see it already, just not call it by that name. Um, in our way of doing poetry, we think about things like rhyming and, and meter. And both of those have in common the idea of things that are parallel, right? So you've got parallel word sounds, Jack and Jill went up the hill. Or the parallel rhythm and meter, Jack and Jill went up the hill. It's, it's parallel in that way. Hebrew poetry doesn't really use those things. What it uses is parallel ideas. Psalm 1 is a great example of this. And you'll see it right away. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You see that? And then notice, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You've noticed that before, even if you didn't call it parallelism, I'm sure. In verse 2, you have a couplet. You've got two lines that are set in tandem. They serve each other. Uh, in verse 1, you've got three, a triplet. And sometimes there are even more than three lines that are used to develop a complete couplet. Not often. Um, the degree of correspondence between the lines will vary, but often it's quite strong, where it sounds as if the two lines are almost identical to each other. Um, I'll show you another example of this, just one psalm over, Psalm 2 and verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Line 2, the Lord holds them in derision. So notice the elements in the first line that are parallel to the second line. In line one, he who sits in the heavens is parallel to the Lord, in line two. And then in the first line, laughs is parallel to, holds them in derision. So it isn't simply that their goal was to say the same thing two different ways. Uh, preachers do that, right? Um, I remember when I was uh, just getting started, uh, I did what young guys do, and you, you read a passage, you, you're having a hard time thinking of ways to, to comment on it. Um, you say about one thing and you're off to another passage and you're looking at like 50 of them about the course of the lesson and you're speeding through it and nobody really gets time to kind of just chew on it for a little while. Um, and I remember one older preacher coming up to me and he said, you need to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell it to them, and then tell them what you told them. Um, 
That's more the idea, of course, of, of an introduction of the material and diving into the material and then summing up the journey, which is wise advice. Um, in Hebrew poetry, the lines aren't meant to just be different versions of the same thing. So if you look at the, the second line of a couplet, what the second line does is it reemphasizes or gives greater focus or clarity or detail than that first line did. So look at the example here. The first line says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. A lot of different reasons you can laugh. But the additional point that the second line gives us as it restates the same basic point is this, of course, isn't the laughter of amusement. This is the laughter of derision, scornful laughter. The one who sits in the heavens is the Lord. So that's what's going on most of the time when you read lines of Hebrew poetry that are working together. Most of the time, the way that they correspond to each other is by using the second line to restate the basic idea of the first line, but to enhance it with extra focus or make it more specific or more intense or more concrete. Um, so look at verse 3 in Psalm 2. The first line, these are the ones at whom the Lord is laughing. So the nations that say, let us burst their bonds apart. And the second line says, and cast away their cords from us. So the first line, burst their bonds apart. The parallel in the second line is cast away their cords. And then the let us would parallel loosely with from us. In Psalm 2, the nations don't want to be under God's reign through his anointed king. So the nations are, in verse 1, raging and plotting, and they're going to burst their bonds apart. But they're not going to simply break the bonds, they're going to cast them away. So you can see, it's restating the basic point, but it adds more vivid detail and information. <coughs> Give you another example. Proverbs 4, verse 3. This one's a bit more tricky. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, <coughs> So in the first line, when I was a son, you see how that would be parallel? And it helps to kind of approach it from the other side too. So with my father, obviously parallels within the sight of my mother. So when I was a son, and also tender, the only one. So the second line restates, but it focuses that first line. It's not just simply a son, it's an only son a tender son, perhaps at a tender age, of perhaps even a young only child. And it brings the mother in as well as it mentions that tenderness and just adds all that familiar color to the, to the text. Um, once you start to look for this, you'll see this characteristic feature of Hebrew poetry all over the Old Testament. And it is critical just all over the place. Because sometimes one of those lines is really clear, and the second one's kind of confusing. Well, if you've got one that's really clear, you get to deduce what that second line's talking about with the parallel thought in the first one. But also what it does is it gets you to think about how these two lines relate to each other, how they work together. Um, in Isaiah 17, here's some of the poetry we'll find in the prophets. Isaiah 17 and verse 1. Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. So line one, it's going to cease to be a city. That's not good. But line two, it's because it will become a heap of ruins. Much more vivid language than simply Damascus isn't going to be a city anymore. Damascus is going to be a heap of ruins. That's a lot more punch. And again, that, that's one of the ways that the poetry of the Old Testament is designed to affect us the way that it does. That, that's an image that sticks in your head. Cease to be a city. That's not good, but it's, it's kind of flat. Heap of ruins is dramatic and engages your emotions and, and your memory also. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse 10, line 1 says, Then your barns will be filled with plenty, line 2, and your vats will be bursting with wine. So notice how the line uh, refocuses, or how the second line refocuses the thought of the first line. First of all, it's not just that your barns will be filled, and filled with what will grain would be the idea. But it's not just that your barns will be filled with grain, it's that your vats of wine are, are going to be filled to bursting. So the barns being filled with plenty is, is wonderful, but then think the magnitude of blessing that's increased when your vats are not just filled, but they're bursting over. 
you have full containers and then even more than your containers can hold. So you can see how that idea works. This is how they thought of poetry. They didn't try to rhyme words or line up rhythm. They thought about parallel ideas that unfolded and elaborated and, and, or, and, and elaborated grew. Uh, we mentioned this one uh, just a moment ago. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. So you got another restatement and also more information and even enhanced information. So the ears of the Lord are added to the idea of his eyes. And again, that's anthropomorphism taking place. But it's not just the righteous that he's paying attention to. It's the cry of the righteous. Psalm 145 and verse 10. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. So that first line, all your works, and the second line focuses all your saints. So all the works of God, especially his people, will give him praise, bless him. So it is a, a very simple concept, but I'll tell you, I had to have it pointed out to me. I was in my 20s. Um, with it in mind, then Hebrew poetry just comes alive. It's not just two lines of the same stuff. There's so much more going on. It's two lines that correspond to each other, but they enhance the thought and they give it depth and they progress the idea. Psalm 6, verse 2. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. There's a lot of reasons a person can languish. Line 2 fills in the picture. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. That's the graciousness of God that this psalmist seeks, is healing. He's languishing because his bones are troubled. Or uh, Job 41, verse 24. His heart is as hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone. So, um, in one line, or in line one, you have a stone. In line two, you have the, the lower millstone. I should have shown you a picture of this. If you think about how a millstone works, you've got one that's on the bottom, one that's grinding against it. Well, obviously, which one of those two stones has to be harder? It's the one that's being ground into. So it's, it's not just as hard as stone. It's hard as the hardest stone. That's how hard this heart is. And that, again, kind of pulls into, uh, well, that pulls into this the importance of, of something else that we talked about before. We talked about studying the Bible within its historical context. So if you know a thing or two about millstones entering this text, well, then you're probably good to go. If you don't, there's something to, well, why that figure? And go familiarize yourself with ancient millstones to understand the point of this word picture. Very typically, a commentary on the Psalms is going to mention something about that. You can kind of get a one-stop shop for it. We would say his heart is hard, hard like a diamond. Then one that I think is, is very poignant, and we'll use this to wrap up. Isaiah 1, verse 3. God says through Israel, or through Isaiah, to his people, The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So notice it's not just the owner. It's, it's master's crib. So right there nestled where it should be safe. But then if you look at lines 3 and 4, it becomes more personal, right? Israel is exchanged for my people. And that just refocuses the idea. So it's not just any nation, it's my people. And look at how the, the four lines work together. If you pit the first couplet against the second, the basic point. The point is even animals know how to stay with their master. But my people Israel does not know. And that packs a punch. So this is the kind of thing where, where you can sort of start to take all the different things that we've been talking about before and, and begin to put them together. When you're going through a psalm and you're looking for that Hebrew parallelism as it's developing those ideas, and you're making sure to read it mindful of the punctuation, not the, the, the line breaks, and getting the flow of all that, and you come across some bit of imagery that you don't quite understand, and you go digging into that, and all of a sudden that psalm just comes into vibrant life for you in a way that it hadn't before.
We talked about, we talked a moment ago, just about how brief poetry often is. Isaiah doesn't use many words here. But they really do make quite an impact. Because of the, the pictures that these lines create. And the artistry of how those thoughts work together. Even farm animals know their master. My people does not know me. And honestly, I didn't count them up, but what is there, less than 25, I imagine? Isaiah doesn't say a lot. But he says a lot. And that's one of the wonderful strengths of poetry in general, but then um, anything that is, is strong when employed by God and crafted by his inspiration is just marvelously impactful. Biblical poetry is just one of the richest resources we have. And I hope you already spend a great deal of time in it. And I hope that perhaps our study and, and closer look at how to study biblical poetry will help you in those times. If by chance you are a Christian and you have not been staying close to your master and have been living as if you don't know who your master is anymore, now is a, a very good opportunity, perhaps the only one you'll have, to repent before him and do what is right. And to show him the gratitude that he's due for all that he's done, for all of his care for you. And return to your owner, return to that safety of your master. And if we can pray with you about that, I encourage you about that. Let us stand with you. Yeah.